Thank you for attending this presentation. My name is Dr. Vincent Guida. I'm an associate professor of geriatrics at the Corinne Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine at Nova Southeastern University. This lecture is part of the South Florida Geriatric Workforce Education Program, and the topic that we'll be discussing today is geriatrics in a multicultural society. We're going to discuss the juxtaposition actually of three cultures the culture that of the patients that we treat, the culture of the clinicians, and the culture of medicine itself. We should be aware from the beginning that it's important to be aware of the ethnic and racial background of our patients. This will aid uh, in our care and understanding uh, a little bit about the uh, patients and how they structure their lives, but we must remember that Despite being parts of an ethnic group or a racial group, patients are individuals. And each individual in that group may be very different. So having said that, my goal will be to cover a little bit of the scope of multiculturalism, some tools, strategies, and plans uh, to deal with this, to make our care more effective. And then I will devote some time to the care of geriatric sexual minorities. With regards to the scope of multiculturalism, this slide demonstrates uh, the projected change in the uh, racial and ethnic makeup of our country. Um, the bar graph on the left represents the makeup of our country racially and uh, on an ethnic basis in 2000 and the projected makeup uh, in the year 2050. Uh, the tall blue column uh, on the left is the percent of our uh, population in the year 2000 uh, that is white or that was white. The white above that is the Latino population. The darker blue is the African American population and the light blue is the Asian population. If you look at the projection for 2050, you'll see that uh, as a percentage of the population, white non-Latino will decrease from 69% to 52.8, that our African-American population will increase from 12.5% to 24.5%. Correction, I'm sorry, our Latino population will increase from 12.5% to 25%. Our African-American population will increase slightly from 12.1% to 13.6%, and our Asian population on a percentage basis will increase dramatically from 3.7% to 8.2%. Okay, when we speak of culture, uh, we're speaking about learned and understood deeply rooted beliefs. Uh, and those beliefs encompass how people organize, relationships between gender, class, uh, friendships, uh, motivation, um, what motivates us, what, what methods do we um, try to achieve success through, how, um, interpretation of our life events, and perception of ourself, our, our own self-identity and respect. So all of, the, all of these things are um, basically imprinted uh, within members uh, of a culture. Okay, so some of these uh, factors are fairly uh, obvious, uh, factors that, that create our diversity, things like religion, race, ethnicity, language, gender. Those are readily apparent to us. But underneath the surface, there are other issues. Um, within a, uh, a culture or an ethnic group, uh, how does age uh, affect how individuals interact? How does the educational status of individuals within that culture affect the way they interact? How does social standing affect the way individuals interact? How mobile are individuals within that society uh, to move uh, to different status groups? And then how is one's gender, one, one's sexual orientation affect uh, how that person uh, interacts with uh, his uh, peers within his uh, uh, cultural group? So all of these factors uh, that help to create diversity uh, are 
elements that we have to address uh, when we treat patients. We want to try to eliminate uh, racial and ethnic uh, disparities so that th we don't create ethnic health disparities. We want to deliver health care services that meet social and cultural and linguistic needs of our patients. Uh, so certainly language is one of the most apparent differences. Um, it's estimated that um, approximately 10% uh, of the population, or 37 million adults, speak a language other than English as their primary language within the house, um, within their household. Um, and of those uh, 37 million, 48% believe that they speak English less than well. Okay? Now, in addition to language, we communicate um, in other ways, uh, through eye contact, uh, through touch, um, we respect different cultures, respect uh, personal space in a different way. Um, assertiveness is handled differently in different cultures. Modesty varies. I mean, of course, dietary practices vary. So we have uh, verbal communication, and there are nonverbal issues um, as well. Okay, so why are these things important? Well, if we have verbal language barriers, it's going to be hard to communicate with patients in order to come to agreement on complex health decisions, um, understanding instructions, reading pill bottles, comprehending educational material that we provided to the patients to help them better understand their illnesses or uh, health problems, and something as simple as just completing our intake forms or, or just the routine paperwork that comes up uh, as we attempt to obtain health care. So, you know, clearly uh, our, our communication is, is vitally important. Okay, I think I'm back on track. Okay, so what are some strategies? Well, first of all, um, we can look within ourselves a little bit and look at our own sociocultural group and, and see what, what stigmas the, that we've been, been ingrained with. Um, a little bit of self-reflection on our part with regards to our own personal biases and prejudices. This, this, this is a good place uh, to start. Okay, we need to think about how our own perceptions um, differ from those of people from other cultural backgrounds. We need to recognize that we've sort of been pre-programmed and we need to recognize that the programming of other cultures may not. So we need to think about what our own attitudes are toward adults um, who might come from a lower socioeconomic status, who have limited English or minimal health literacy, um, or who are immigrants with an accent, who are, who are difficult to understand. Something, something as simple as that um, is important. We need to, to recognize what our own biases are. So once we, once we do recognize that, we, we, need, we need to keep an, an open mind an open mind about how others might look at um, their interaction with us, their interaction with their illness, their interaction with, with the, the medical culture. So we, we need to ask. It's not possible for us to know how every culture and every society looks, uh, looks at health. It, it would be daunting. So we, we can ask. We can ask regarding beliefs that the patients might have as to causation of their illness to prevention, to intervention, to treatment. Um, some, some societies believe that illness is brought down upon them because of something bad that they did. So that this causation piece might be something very important to address. Uh, prevention, uh, intervention, um, some societies um, uh, uh, clearly um, rely much more heavily than ours does on herbal remedies, um, uh, folk cures, um, uh, healers, faith healers, etc. So we need to have an understanding of how that impacts uh, the patient's interaction uh, with their uh, medical care. Okay, so again, we, we can't possibly know everything about every culture, so it's simple. What you don't know, you invite an explanation. You ask. Asking tends to build trust. Um, patients will sense if you have an interest in them that you truly are interested in helping them, this is going to help to build trust. So what are some of the, some of the strategies to build trust? Well, we've just discussed curiosity, certainly empathy, uh, humility, 
Um, this is not a time uh, to interact with patients and be a strict authoritarian. Um, you just don't know the territory. You need to be open-minded. Humility is, is probably the key word there. Uh, inquiry, reflection. Um, all of these uh, qualities will help you um, to attain a, a better outcome. Okay. Um, we can do some other things. You know, our healthcare organizations can help us. We have social workers um, and, and f folks who are themselves from the same culture uh, that work within the hospital. Um, so the, the tapping into these resources will certainly help us in, in dealing uh, with patients, especially those uh, of you who are uh, embarking on your medical careers and um, are practicing within, within hospitals where you have uh, this type of support. Um, your organization may have interpreters. Um, because of your location, uh, the, the organization may well have minority staff of the, the same minority of the patients you're caring for. This will certainly be a great help. Um, you know, clearly, uh, the location and hours of your healthcare facility um, will, will certainly help. Obviously, if you're in a, a location where the majority of the uh, residents uh, that uh, utilize your services are in a service industry, for example, restaurant work, food preparation, they may work at night. Um, so having uh, early uh, morning hours uh, might be advantageous uh, to those patients. And conversely, folks that uh, work uh, early morning hours having evening hours. Um, so organizations need to be um, flexible. Um, having your organization incorporate cultural um, specific attitudes and values would likewise be helpful. Coordinating with uh, traditional leaders in the community uh, and partnering, partnering with uh, community health services. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about um, sexual minorities. So this would be LB, LBGTQ um, uh, patients, and specifically we're going to talk a little bit about geriatric patients. Um, so we're dis we'll be discussing uh, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, transgender, asexual, and unlabeled sexual minorities. So a little bit about the demographics. So these numbers are clearly um, going to be soft. They're hard numbers to come by for obvious reasons. People are not to have forthcoming with this type of private information. But this slide, I think, uh, demonstrates, and it's over a short period of time, just um, eight years, demonstrates uh, what's uh, been happening in America, and, and, and that is that we have uh, become much more accepting of sexual diversity. Okay, a little bit more about demographics. So um, it was estimated that in the year 2000, there were 1 to 2.8 million LGBTQ um, elderly 65 and older. It's projected that there um, would probably be 2 to 6 million by the year 2030. Look at the spread, 2 to 6 million. Uh, it's clearly an indication of the, 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 um, the difficulty in uh, obtaining uh, good solid numbers. But clearly, um, I believe that two factors are in play. One is that we've got a larger population of 65 and older um, going forward. And I think that uh, our society has become a lot more open with regards to sexual diversity. So those numbers um, uh, are clearly um, rising and it's an issue that you're gonna be dealing with in your careers. Um, the LGBTQ community is racially diverse. Um, economically, um, these um, individuals um, are economically um, similar to heterosexuals. However, they're more likely to live in urban areas uh, compared uh, to homosexuals. Okay, um, a little bit more about the demographics. So, um, th the LGBTQ geriatric population is less likely to be partnered, 20% um, versus 50% of all elders. Um, they're more likely to live alone. Well, clearly, if you're not partnered, you're going to be um, uh, perhaps uh, living alone. So 65 to 75 percent of LGBTQ are believed to live alone as opposed to 36 percent um, of uh, all the elderly. Um, there's no reliable data that uh, is able Sorry. 
Um, clearly, if they're um, closeted, they're going to have unrecognized needs. They will have real or anticipated fear of discrimination, both from the staff, other residents, or indeed their uh, physician caregivers. They will fear disclosure. And by virtue of uh, being in, in long-term care facilities, the loss of their network or chosen family um, it will certainly uh, impact their health. All right, so um, surveys of LGBT uh, adults um, perceive the following. 73% um, believe that discrimination exists. 60% believe uh, that they do not have equal access to social uh, and health services. 34% believe um, that uh, it would be best for them to hide their orientation. Some surveys of caregivers, 23% believe that the healthcare system um, somewhat or very often treats LGBT uh, patients unfairly. This was a Kaiser study um, looking at physicians in the year uh, 2002. Um, a New York area aging um, agency on aging survey, 46% uh, reported LGBT elderly not welcome at senior centers. Uh, a survey of social workers, 52%, this is in 1996, reported intolerant or condemning attitude toward nursing home staff, toward lesbians and gay men. Now, clearly, this study was a good 20 years ago. Hopefully, uh, these numbers are less, but recognize that uh, these attitudes persist. Right. So what can we do to, to basically ameliorate uh, some of these problems? Well, first of all, when we're interacting with our patients, we can avoid making assumptions about the gender of the patient's partner, even if the patient in conversation says, I'm married. We can um, not assume that patient's sexuality is fixed, absolute, or lifelong. Um, I, I made this point earlier uh, on the slide where we discussed uh, interactions with children and grandchildren. Um, we should... Um, recognize that being gay, lesbian, or bisexual um, is a difficult issue. We can't assume that uh, even if the patient comfortably uh, discusses this with us, we can't, we can't assume that this does not create stress. Um, we need to be careful about um, outing these patients in our care. That's, that's not our prerogative. We need to respect their privacy. Um, and, and uh, finally, we need to recognize that older people continue to have an active sex life. Um, and and that, um, that is important, obviously, in our things. I'm sorry, uh, again, a little technical glitch here. One of the things that we can do to let our patients know that um, we're open to discussions, and, and, and that is, first of all, um, let individuals know that, that, that uh, our practice um, um, is open to the LGBT community. Um, you know, make yourself available to referral programs. Um, when patients come to the office, use forms um, that are inclusive. For example, instead of um, uh, having a box that has husband's name, wife's name, use partner or spouse, something as simple as that. Um, talk with your registration staff and your, your clinic director and uh, have them um, recognize uh, the, um, the desire that you have uh, to make your practice welcoming to the LGBT community. Uh, and then simple things um, like uh, some literature or um, some stickers or signs uh, showing support of the LGBT community. Um, and then you know, be open to dialogue with your... So again, with, with regards to uh, our desire to be culturally um, competent. So we want to be aware. We want to be open. We want to um, have um, our support available. And we want to advocate. All right, so th this is a slide that I particularly um, like. Um, interestingly, it's, it's provided um, 
uh, by the doctor's company. The doctor's company is a medical malpractice company. It's actually an excellent one there. Uh, they defend their doctors well. Um, uh, they're, uh, they're very receptive to educating physicians on how to avoid malpractice. And then they've come up with these three little questions that you should think about at the end of a patient interaction. So one is, have the patient verbalize to you what their main problem is. Make sure they have an understanding of what, what their issues are. Um, ask them, based on the information that you've given them, do they understand what they need to do, what they need to follow through on in order to work through the problem? And then finally, why it's important that they do, do those things. Why is it important that they follow through and complete those? Okay? I think if you do this, regardless of whether you're dealing with patients from your own ethnicity, your own culture, um, uh, and this is going to help you. It's definitely going to help you when you're dealing with a little bit more difficult communication. Uh, at the end of, of this discussion, what I'd like you to do is to um, use uh, the, your scanners, scan uh, the survey um, so that we can get some of your feedback. I'd like to thank you for your interest and your attention.